what is a piece of advice you could give to other aspiring mathematicians like myself? Hmm. I'd say, number one, uh, the sky is the limit. Mathematics is such a phenomenally powerful tool and I'm always amazed by people who I know who do mathematics and the way that they apply them. So, for example, before we started recording, Oliver, you mentioned uh, this conversation I got to have with a mathematician named Po Shen Lo, and he solves all these incredible problems around, say, for example, how to use graph theory and, and topology, which are really seemingly esoteric piece of maths that are abstract and don't seem to have much to do with everyday life. Nonetheless, he designed an app that would use... Uh, that kind of mathematics to help people know when they should stay home rather than get out there in a global pandemic and, and, and risk infection. Things like that improve our quality of life. They help us to, to be safe. It's amazing to me that for something like public health, which you wouldn't necessarily guess is a mathematically rich field, is actually filled with all kinds of really important models that help us make good decisions. So, for anyone who's looking towards mathematics, I want to say absolutely go for it. It's a really exciting direction to head in. And I'm hoping for as many aspiring mathematicians as there are, there might be as many aspiring teachers. What advice do you have for the aspiring teachers among the audience? I know I'm biased, but uh, what a privilege and amazing opportunity it is to have the opportunity to inform and shape the next generation. Uh, I reflect on the fact that, you know, for the six years that I get to interact with a set of students from year seven to year 12, and the interactions that you get to have during this really pivotal formative stage of their lives, we as teachers get to be uh, the the adults, the grown-ups for these people who are working out who they're going to be in the future. And Frankly, let's be realistic, these teenage adolescents, sometimes the grown-ups in their own life, their, their, their parents or family, they might be the last people that they ever want to seek for advice. And we get to be there providing thought, shaping character. Is there anything of more nobility and dignity than having the opportunity to have that life-on-life -life interaction with a young person. To me, that's what, that's what animates me. Uh, that's what motivates all the work that I get to do. And, you know, I think that as someone who believes that every, every human being, every individual who I interact with is of infinite worth and dignity and, and is worth investing in, uh, what a joy it is to be able to play a small part in the role, uh, in, in their journey to becoming a, you know, informed, constructive citizen in our society. I don't think there's anything better. I couldn't agree more. No greater privilege. Okay, another question I'd like, um, who's your favourite mathematician? Who is my favourite mathematician? Hmm. I'm going to go for an unusual choice, okay? Uh, my favourite mathematician is Carl Friedrich Gauss. He was a German mathematician who did a lot of work in, in number theory. The reason why I'm picking him is because uh, he has one of my favorite quotes of all time, which is that mathematics is about thinking deeply on simple things. That's all maths is. I know it can seem intimidating sometimes, and especially when you encounter a page full of symbols and equations, it can be a lot to take in. But actually, mathematics has some of the simplest objects we can ever imagine. A number, two, three, five, a hundred, um, a circle, a square. These are some of the simplest things that anyone can even conceive of, and yet uh, we can find incredible patterns in them. So that's why I'm going to go for gas today. I'm having a hard time choosing my favourite mathematician. Oliver, what's yours? My favourite? Um, that is a tough question, yeah. I would probably have to go for, I mean, I'd have probably have to go for Jean-Baptiste, Joseph Fourier. Mm -hmm. He's probably my favourite. Uh, just the work he's done is, you know, amazing. I mean, it's a bit, bit out of my league so far, mm -hmm. so I can't say that I've... I've looked at some of his stuff, but it's very advanced. But it's just amazing... Well, actually, I might have to change that answer. I think based on what we mentioned before, it might have to be Leonard Euler. Mm. Euler was called the master of us all, and he just made contributions to so many diverse fields of mathematics. He was kind of like a... Um, you talked about mathletes before, right? He's kind of like the equivalent of a pentathlete. It's like, not only am I good at this and this and this, I can just do it all, and Euler was a bit like that. Eddie, having created nearly 5,000 videos... 
What has been your favorite to film and why? <laughs> Uh, the favorite one to film is probably one which almost broke my microphone, which sounds funny, but you can actually hear my, my microphone almost breaking. It's one where I turned up for a morning class and it was dead of winter. So it's quite dark and everyone's kind of rolling in and, and half asleep. And the night before I'd been reading a book by a mathematician uh, called Stephen Strogatz. The book's called The Joy of X, and in it, I encountered this diagram that I'd never seen before. So you asked me before about algebra geometry. This is part of why, right? Now, I won't bother trying to explain it on an audio format, but the key thing about this thing that I encountered in Stephen's book was that it was something that made sense of something I remember learning when I was 14, 15 years old and never really made sense to me. I could do the process. It was called completing the square. It's an algebraic thing, but I never really knew why it worked. It just sort of did its thing and, and I didn't know any more than that. Stephen Josegatz had these diagrams in his book that explained how it worked and I'd never seen this. And I'd been teaching for seven, eight years at this point. I feel like... How did no one ever tell me about this before? And so I came into class. The lesson that I was about to teach had nothing to do with this concept. But I said, hey, everyone, I have to tell you what this is, right? And so I started to draw up on the board. And you can hear because it, it my microphone just cuts out because there's such a voluminous roar within the classroom. You can hear the moment that my students have the same response emotionally that I did. This kind of like, I cannot believe I've known this for this long, but not really understood it. So that's probably my favorite. Was this by chance in reference to like the actual geometric de de depiction of completing the square with two physical squares. Yep, that's the one. Yeah, I've, I had the same reaction when I first saw that, I think. Yeah, it's just wild. Uh, and there's so many things in maths, which I think is, it's a criticism of mathematics education as a whole that so many of us have come out of it with a bunch of things in our head. We could probably recite it, but we don't really know why those things were or why they make sense. And that's part of my mission as a mathematics educator to, to change that and to improve that because understanding is what it's all about. Letty, thanks so much for joining us today. That's been a terrific conversation. And I think for both the mathematicians among us and the teachers among us, you've given us a lot to think about when considering the right pathway for them and the many roads that get to the same destination. That's been terrific. So thank you. Yeah. Kevin Ola, thanks for having me. Thanks. No problem. Yeah.